Hello everyone. Um, from time to time I can tell when I've got an idea that will be particularly interesting to those of you who've been watching my YouTube channel for a very long time and also probably cross over into other uh, clicks here on YouTube where other people would want to hear the story. Uh, but this one, uh, even though I like to be transparent about many parts of my life, I I sat on this one for a long time. Uh, it hurt, and I didn't want anyone fucking with my real life by learning certain uh, aspects of my life and trying to uh, take their YouTube grudges to my real life, as has happened in the past. Um, <clears throat> some examples of this being somebody telling my girlfriend that... I tried to do things that I didn't. Uh, also, uh, someone posting on my Facebook page for a business that I owned. Uh, a whole bunch of crazy nonsense. Um, these things happen. Uh, and it, they've happened to other YouTubers in worse ways. And I've talked about this many times on my YouTube channel. So, this was one where I was uh, a little apprehensive about ever wanting to tell you guys this. But... Um, I've been pretty open about my life here on YouTube and, and tried to be as transparent as I can and, and let you guys figure out who I am on the inside through the lens of this camera. Um, and so I just sat on this and, and waited till the, the feelings were, uh, a little bit less and so I could handle this without, like, misting up in my eyes when I'm telling this story. Um... But yeah, this will be the story of how Nick Bravo lost me a job. And uh, in order to tell the story, I've got to give you a whole bunch of backstory about my life in order for you to understand how much this hurt. Okay, so uh, when I started this YouTube channel back in 2010, when I switched over to this channel from my old channels... I, at the time, was a union electrician, and I was primarily working in uh, the southern part of Texas and Louisiana. And I posted a couple videos about that, but I really wanted to transition from being an electrician to actually using my degree in psychology. Um, I'd always had an interest in it, I just couldn't break out of the field that I was in because it didn't monetarily make sense. Uh, I had applied for jobs in Louisiana where I was uh, denied the job because I was making too much money as an electrician. They saw how much money I was making, they saw the amount of money that that job paid, and they're like, you're never going to stay. You know, And that had haunted me for a very long time. When you're making over $30 an hour, and then you're applying for jobs that sometimes don't even come up to like $16 an hour to, in order to start your life over. And I, I know a lot of people have gone through this. You know, many people have that midlife crisis where they switch their careers. And it, it's, it's hard for employers to trust that you're going to stick around when you look like a very upwardly mobile person. And they're looking to train a new employee to work for low pay and to stay with them for decades and keep uh, getting job experience at that same job and getting better and better at that job but never wanting more pay and never wanting to climb the ladder. That's what employers are looking for in many jobs and uh, I tried so hard to find a, a bottom of the totem pole entry level job in psychology with just a bachelor's degree in psychology and that's very hard to do. Uh, many people have said you need at least a master's degree uh, and I found that to not be true, but initially, for me, it was true. Uh, now I know better ways to get in on the bottom level, as I have done in my life, and I've been able to transition my career from what I had been doing as a trade to what I learned in my university. So, uh, I moved to Colorado at the end of 2010 after a very long tour of America, driving around 
um, visiting other YouTubers, and that culminated in a series on my channel where I was doing a road survey of all these different YouTubers, and then I compared all of their answers. And that was the first road survey that I did. In the middle of that trip, I got a call from my brother, and I'm not going to go too far into this, but uh, he was going to be going through a very horrible divorce, and he needed my help. And so I cut that trip short. I was in Aldous Valor's house in Pennsylvania, and I decided to, to cut my whole trip short and drive all the way back to Colorado to see what was going on. And I found that my brother was in a very bad place. So I drove back to Louisiana in Lake Charles, where I was living, packed up all my shit, moved out to Colorado. And you guys have seen part of this play out here on this YouTube channel. When I got here, I still had that, uh, that dream of transitioning my career from being an electrician to working in the field of psychology. And I did a job search. As I was helping my brother through those tough times of his divorce and helping watch his kids and staying at his place and helping him uh, finish his undergrad degree because he couldn't do that while he was married. A lot of things came up in their very rocky marriage. So as I was doing that, I was still looking for a way to transition to a different job. And I was on unemployment for a very long time. And... I was looking at these jobs as though, well, if I'm going to take one of these jobs, they better pay better than unemployment. Because at the time, you could stay on unemployment for years if you were laid off and you were making a certain amount of pay and, you know, you worked a certain amount of credits. You could stay on it for years. And I was looking at all these jobs and they paid worse than my unemployment would pay because I had been an electrician. And that, the cutoff for that was around $16 an hour. It would take for me to want to take a job and drive with my truck to that job back and forth because I would make less money if I was taking a job for less pay than that. And there were many times where I found that the only way for me to break into a career in psychology was to take an unpaid internship in order to get the licenses required for, for working in the field for pay, you would have to work so many thousands of hours for free. And I don't work for free. I can't afford for free, working for free. I didn't get born with a silver spoon in my mouth, right? So I was looking at all of the different licenses that you would need to get a really good paying job, starting out with just a bachelor's degree. And when I did my job search, I found a job working for the state of Colorado. And it would be in prisons. This job listing start it had many jobs listed on the same site where you could see how there was a good progression where as you uh, get certain stages of your academic career in order, you would, you would be able to progress in this job as a career and stay in these places. And it looked like it paid a, a a hell of a lot of money and all it would take was a couple different certifications that I would have to get over a couple of years. So this was in 2010 this this listing was posted and it was posted with an open-ended uh, end date. There was there was no taking down this listing. They always needed people in this job and this job was working in the field of addictions, in prisons, counseling people who, who are incarcerated and they need to uh, not have that great recidivism rate that they've had where, you know, people, people get stuck in this uh, cycle of going back to prison over and over again for drugs. And I thought, well, that, that's a career that I could, I could do because my body's been breaking down ever since I left the army as a disabled vet. You know, there's only so many times you can swing a hammer or pull wire as an electrician before your body just breaks. And I really needed to transition. So I looked at the, the requirements for that job, which happened to be the best paying job that I could find. And I decided to pattern my life after 
getting all of the prerequisites for this job because at the time I had no experience, which was one of the requirements, and I also had none of the uh, certifications for the state. And the only thing I really had was my bachelor's degree in psychology. Um, that was it. And so I knew I wasn't going to get the job then. Um, I tried for a couple years to find a way to earn those hours in order to get those certifications. And uh, nothing came up. Nothing that would not have me losing money by hundreds of dollars every month. Nothing came up. Um, I could not find anything really in the Colorado Springs area for uh, years. And it wasn't until I moved up to uh, Denver a couple years ago that I was able to find actual paying jobs where I could get those hours. You know, because, like I said, I, I can't afford to live for free. You know, no one's, no one's helping me out here. You know, I'm not still in grad school. I, I put myself through grad, or sorry, sorry, I'm not still an undergrad. I, no one put me through school. Right, I used the GI Bill that I worked hard for in order to get through school. There's no one helping me out. Right, I finally got to a position where uh, I was living with Misty, and we're sharing bills in the house, and I could afford to take a, a job paying shit pay. Right, shit shit pay. And around that time, you would have seen the frequency of videos here on my YouTube channel uh, really affected by that. You know, and I stopped uh, even trying to be a YouTube star at all around that time because I decided, you know what, Th there's a career that I can actually choose to have that will bear fruit versus this volatile platform. Um, I'm never going to uh, be primarily paid by YouTube. But at that time, <laughs> when I first took that shit job, uh, YouTube was about a fifth of my income. Seriously, because I was not getting paid a lot. And uh, I, I did a whole series of videos of what I could say about that job here on this YouTube channel. That was years ago. And people really commended me for telling some of those stories because, uh, well, they're, they're shocking, some of them. I told the most shocking stories. But um, also... It gave a a different perspective on working in some behavioral healthcare fields. Now, uh, since then, I've taken jobs where I have to be a lot more confidential with uh, patients' uh, information, and some of the things that I've read about the the type of jobs that I've had have been so strict. Where, if I were to come home and say oh man, last night I, I had like 10 clients and I just had this horrible time with each one of them. That would be against the law. Like, just telling you that I saw a client last night is breaking their confidentiality. Even if I keep it as, as anonymous as that. And even here, I'm keeping it within the context of an example. I'm not tell, telling you whether or not I saw a client last night. But um, that's how strict I could interpret some of the laws about some of the jobs that I've had. And so I, I don't talk about that. And so there's this giant, this giant gap in what I'm able to be transparent about with you guys. And sometimes I go through a lot of stress uh, dealing with certain issues on the job. And I can't have this outlet where I used to put everything that I saw out on YouTube. You know, I used to be a vlogger, and now I'm half a vlogger. I'm half the vlogger I used to be. But I, I do see that I can make a career of this. And after years of working my way up in different jobs where I could collect all of the hours required to get all of the certifications in order to get that job that I first spotted in 2010. I finally applied, thinking, well, I've got the minimum amount of qualifications, 
at least I could get an interview and see how this interview process will work. Maybe I might have to be interviewed a couple times over a couple years, but maybe I could finally break out into that high-paying career track that I first identified in 2010. So I applied last year. Uh, the application process was kind of streamlined in a way that uh, I was not prepared for. It happened very, very quickly. Um, there are certain parts of my life that are, I guess, they're seen as uh, points on a resume that, that would get you ahead in life where I take them for granted. One of which is that I'm a, a sizable man who has no criminal record and it all is also a disabled vet. All of those things give me points uh, in order to get hired. I've, I've gone through many different interviews where just my size alone has been, wow, you know, this guy would be nice to have around because he can really handle clients who get out of line. You know, it's, it is what it is, but I wasn't expecting with this career uh, that I was trying to get into that it would be that quick because of those factors. So I got called up for uh, an initial interview and I had that over the phone and everything went well. Um, of course they did a little bit of background check on me and around that time I started uh, streamlining my, my YouTube channel to get rid of some of the more uh, weird shit on it, and I cleaned up my social media accounts so that uh, basically I would look like a good employee. Uh, I, I tried to make it so that it, if someone were to hire me, the, these people or anyone else in the future, that they wouldn't be seeing some of the stronger opinions that I've had and in judging me based on that that I was going to be somehow a blight on their uh, company because of my opinions and that that also hurt my my sense of transparency with saying everything that I've have in the past with with you guys because I really value this medium as a catharsis to me I like the idea of me sending messages to the future where some internet archaeologist is watching this video as if it's the day that I made it and he can see how it was to live in America having my perspective, especially the non-religious perspective, and, and seeing what's going on. You know, I love that idea. Um, so I've got kind of... Uh, conflicting things in my head uh, as to what my priorities are and I tried to, to manage that as as well as I could and still stay true to who I was right so there was an application for this job right and I felt like I hit every major point that I needed to hit on it but because this was a job working for the state for uh, basically the Department of Corrections, there were uh, special questions that they asked. And being a person who has no criminal record, I wasn't really afraid of them finding anything, really. And I was particularly forthcoming on their questionnaire. And one of the questions they asked, the one that pertains to the title of this video, is, have you ever corresponded with a person in prison? Well, being that this was going to culminate in an integrity interview, and I wanted to show that I had the utmost integrity, I answered every question as honestly as I could. And there were two people that I had... Uh, 
corresponded with who were incarcerated. The first one was actually my cousin Julie, who those of you who watch my YouTube channel and have watched it for years know that she's dead. Right? And there's there's not really any conflict of interest you can have uh, with someone being in uh, an incarcerated place where you're, you're trying to get a job where you work with incarcerated people. There's no conflict of interest you can have if that person is dead, right? So there was that. The other instance of uh, this where I, I corresponded with some, or attempted to, was uh, Nick Bravo. And on my channel, I learned uh, about Nick Bravo uh, through a lot of different drama here on YouTube. And there, there's no way for me to summarize the entire story of Nick Bravo. Um, those of you who are watching this because you like uh, the drama that Nick Bravo brings, you probably un already know all that stuff. But uh, basically, uh, he had a lot of fights with Habby Cabby. Um, he has been stalked by YouTube trolls relentlessly because uh, he feeds them. Uh, he's fed them for a very long time. And he was involved in a crime that he went to prison for, and uh, people still just can't get enough of that story. And having been somebody who uh, talked with him behind the scenes, I know more about that story than a lot of other people. And I was uh, particularly empathetic to what happened to him. And I decided that since I found how to write him in prison, I would, uh, amongst the, the people who are here in my clique, I would put out a video saying, hey, everybody leave him a comment, and then I'm going to print out everyone's comment, put it with a letter of mine, and I'm going to mail it to Nick Bravo. And if he mails me back, then I'll read out all the answers to all of the comments that he left. Right? Well, the, the letter got rejected. And this is something that played out on my channel. Basically, there were two reasons. Uh, the stupid reason was somebody said, Hey, Nick, you really screwed the pooch this time. And so they had this list of reasons that was kind of like a bingo card, and they highlighted bestiality on it. <laughs> and I'm like, th that's, a, that's a figure of speech, you know. You really fucked the dog this time. So that was kind of stupid. But the other reason was no third-party communications uh, are allowed in prisons. And this is something that I didn't know at the time. But uh, basically it's to keep people from getting communications where they're like still running the gang that they have on the outside by talking through intermediaries uh, in coded messages, you know? And the, the Department of Corrections likes to know each and every person that is talking to each and every person. So they only allow communications for people that they know, not uh, anonymous screen names here on YouTube that they can't verify. So that letter got rejected. And uh, also, Nick Bravo was able to get out of prison in, in a short amount of time. And that also happened uh, almost two years ago now. You know, and, and he was still on paper. Uh, he was still uh, in different various parts of the criminal justice system, but he wasn't behind bars anymore. So... Uh, I was able to talk to him a couple times on social media about all of the things that were going on with that case. And I know that he does not want me to talk much about it, but uh, part of what happened is uh, very key to me telling a part of this story. Um, because after going through all of the initial... Uh, interview parts uh, of getting this job with the Department of Corrections, I was uh, 
initially rejected because they have a rule, it's uh, standard seven, conflict of interest, that if you have corresponded with anyone in prison ever, then you are ineligible for employment with the Department of Corrections. Now, this is something I didn't know, you know. I don't even know that they published their standards like this. They asked on their questionnaire a whole bunch of different things, and I was as honest as I possibly could be. So I was forthcoming about this. The only reason why they really knew that I had tried to correspond with these people was because I told them. Now, I thought they might have some way of like cross-referencing different databases because they scan every letter that ever gets mailed to any inmate. Maybe I thought, I thought maybe they, they would be able to tell if I was lying. But really, I was just trying to be as honest as possible. I expected like polygraph exams, and I expected to be able to answer my for everything that I've ever done to a, an interviewer. So I appealed that initial decision. And part of my appeal reasoning was that when I sent that letter to Nick Bravo, I was imploring him to do something specific. And that was, uh, I was trying to tell him to turn in the other people that were involved in his crime. And I felt like that was a pretty Boy Scout thing of me to do. And for them to... For them to make ineligible an applicant to be a counselor in a prison because he tried to tell someone to do the right thing, I felt was retarded. Like completely idiotic I thought wow you know if they if they're not even going to look at the context of someone trying to do the right thing you know what are they doing here you know it makes sense to me at, at the time I was like it makes sense to me this job has been posted since 2010 and they haven't taken down the listing at all it's because it's impossible to get this job you know the very the littlest thing can uh, trip you up. And I put in that, that uh, appeal that I had been basically fast-tracked in order to get the job through all of the, the phone interviews and whatnot. They loved all of my answers. They, they loved my resume. They wanted me for the job, the, the actual hiring managers. But it was the uh, background tech for the integrity interview that didn't think that I was... A suitable fit for this job, and I thought that uh, that that tech might have been a little uh, basically quick with her judgment and hadn't really read all that I had put in to to the answer because it seemed like regardless of the context, I was going to be ineligible. So when I when I uh, sent my Appeal. I also uh, carbon copied all of the the managers that I would might have been working with the people who work at uh, uh, the the Department of Human Resources for the state that I had also gotten past that level of interviewing all of those people before to just to show them how retarded this process could be if I could get past all of this and that one little thing was going to trip me up they're going to be looking forever for an applicant to be suitable for this job, you know? And this is a waste of taxpayer money if they've got these positions that need to be filled and there's somebody who's that anal retentive that they're going to make me ineligible for trying to tell someone to do the right thing. Uh, which basically would be part of my job if I got the job anyway. You know, and at the time, I was actually working with people, many people who were on probation and parole, and still, because of of the field that I'm in in addictions counseling, you you kind of run across a lot of people who are uh, in various stages of the criminal justice system, and 
to, to say that somebody who's been trying to get experience in this field cannot have had interactions with people who have been in, in trouble with the law is just ludicrous. Even my own field, the, the people who are staff in every place that I work, 40% of them, on average, are going to have had a background where they got in trouble with the law for drugs. They turned their lives around, and now they're counseling people. You know, it's a very big thing in my field. So to say that I can't have had uh, any sort of uh, relationship with anyone from the criminal justice system, you know, or else I'm going to be ineligible is, is just stupid, you know. So that was the basis of my appeal. And when I when I did that, uh, the tech who had reviewed my application had a manager who was an investigator. Um, that was the the title that person had. the The supervisor for that unit they emailed me and said, "You know what? We're going to give you an interview anyway, and we're going to talk about this." So I, uh, I got a new jacket for interviews because it was about that time in my life that I'm going to need this jacket, you know. And I, I uh, bought a new tie, you know, bought a new shirt, uh, got it tailored, looked good, fucking looked good. Um, shave and a haircut, the whole nine yards. Uh, I went down there. And I was expecting about a 30-minute interview. And when I got there, the, the first thing that, that completely shocked me was the person who had initially rejected my application was the person conducting my interview. And since we're talking about conflicts of interest here, let me just lay this out for you in, in plain terms. The person who initially decided that I was ineligible was now in charge of deciding whether she made a mistake the first time around because she was conducting my interview. So, um, I, w I was a little shocked by that. And also, I was expecting... Well, they said it was going to be like a 30-minute inter interview, and then I would get fingerprints taken, and they would do some more background checks on me. And I felt like I, I was going to do pretty good as I walked into this interview, even though it was it was the same tech who who uh, had initially made me ineligible. I felt like I would, I would be able to impress her. The interview actually lasted three times longer than they said. It was uh, an hour and a half. And a good 45 minutes of it was me trying to explain the story of Nick Bravo to this investigator. And let me tell you something. If your job interview turns into you trying to explain the story of Nick Bravo, you're going to get this sinking feeling that you're not getting the job, you know. Um... And there were certain points of this uh, questioning that uh, enlightened me as to certain uh, aspects of the job that I was actually applying to. Uh, one of these things was the tech telling me that she actually had been uh, working in prisons. Uh, and she worked her way from the bottom up to being uh, a tech in the investigative criminal background check part of the the criminal justice system in the CDOC. And so I, I felt like just knowing her background in this, she was at one point a guard. And as fr from that perspective of a guard, what would that guard want in a counselor who's working with the prisoners. You know, that's where she's coming from. And she said to me at one point, I just want to make sure that you're not going to be 
taken in by one of these prisoners' lies like you were taken in by Nick Bravo. And I told her, um, I wasn't taken in by Nick Bravo. We all know he did it. You know, that's part of what I'm trying to tell you is that we know he did it. There were just other people involved that also did it. And I was trying to tell him to turn them in. You know, I don't think that he's innocent. He doesn't say that he's innocent, you know. And she just wasn't getting it. She, she thought that just by virtue of me having had conversations with him, which, by the way, I turned my, my cell phone to her and I showed her how short those conversations had been on Facebook. I'm like, this is the last time I talked to him. It was months ago. You know, and I, here I am still saying, you need to turn in those other guys. You know, she just wasn't getting it. And then she said uh, again, well, I, I think that there's uh, a certain sort of boundary that you need to have and you can't be uh, trusting these guys and everything that they're saying. And I looked at her just square in the eyes and I said, you know, as a counselor, it's very important for us to create an atmosphere of trust when we're talking with our clients. And I know I, I said it as, as flatly as I just said it to you right there. And, it, I know, and I know it came across with a certain amount of condescension. And her eyes turned on me. And that was the moment where I knew, oh shit, this has gone wrong. <laughs> you know? So, 45 minutes into this, she finally says, well, we have to touch all these other uh, different issues uh, that we, we could possibly have. So she starts asking all of the regular questions that you would ask any applicant just to basically dot her I's, cross her T's, and uh, get on with making me ineligible, but still uh, give me the pretense that I still have a chance at this job. But I knew it was it was over, you know. But I, I answered every question from then on, it's still as best I could. I, I put on a good face, you know. I, I did come across another part of this interview where she could have made me ineligible for that reason. And that was the fact that uh, the business that I owned uh, between 2012 and 2014 that I ended up closing because it wasn't making enough money... I actually filed bankruptcy on. And I know the laws about filing bankruptcy, especially when you're applying to state jobs. You are not uh, supposed to be negatively affected by the fact that you have filed a bankruptcy. It is the law that they're not allowed to um, use that as one of their factors that they're considering. right? It's, it's part of the protections of bankruptcy. But the way that she got around asking whether or not I had a bankruptcy, which even that question is against the law for her to ask, she actually asked, have you ever been late on a payment for anything in the past five years? Well, if you're somebody who's had to file bankruptcy, yes, that is the, that is the case. And when they say, well, could you elaborate on what things you were late on paying and why? In order to defend yourself and, and give those reasons why and still look like you have some integrity, you're going to be forthcoming with the fact that you had a bankruptcy. So they get around the, the way that they're not allowed to ask flatly, have you ever had a bankruptcy? By saying, have you ever been late paying on anything? Could you please explain? You know? So, um, she could have made me ineligible for that because, in theory, if you have had money troubles in the past, you could be susceptible to someone, say, bribing you in order to do something in the prison that's not allowed, right? And I'm familiar with this, having been in the military and gotten a secret clearance in the military, um, 
there there are certain things that they think about people who are financially compromised, they call it. And so I waited a couple days after this interview and I got my letter of ineligibility. And when I got it, I was in a Korean restaurant uh, north of Denver and I was eating a bowl of uh, yukejang, I recommend. Uh, wherever you go, it seems like uh, all Korean restaurants get that right. It was the spiciest thing in the uh, restaurant, and I was talking with uh, Misty. She was across the table from me, and I saw the email as it came in on my smartphone, and I opened it up, I started reading it, and I began to cry. And I know that the, the waiter and the rest of the staff at that Korean restaurant was, were probably thinking, Oh, that, that uh, white Yankee, he can't handle his spicy food. He ordered the spiciest thing in the menu, thinking he was a badass, and now he's crying into his soup. Ha 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 ha! You know? But uh, I, I was glad that I had the cover of a spicy soup for me uh, streaming tears down my face in public, you know. Um, and, and the fact that it happened in front of Misty was not easy to take because during this process, I actually went down to the uh, city where I would have been working it wouldn't have been Denver. It would have been out in the boonies. There were only a couple jobs in this field uh, that were open and, and have been open since at least 2010 since I've been looking at the listings. But they're all in places like Sterling, Colorado, uh, Buena Vista, Colorado, Canyon City, Colorado. And uh, during this process, Misty and I had driven out to all of these places in order to... Uh, check them out as far as real estate for moving there. And during that time, Misty told me that she really hoped that I got the job because she really had her heart set on moving out to the mountains. And we spend a lot of time in the mountains here. Um, you've seen a lot of videos from me in the mountains that I've posted to YouTube. And uh, we plan on visiting the mountains even more and filming them even more for you guys, but... Uh, she's got a special affinity with nature that I sometimes don't have, but I really love her, and I really wanted to move her out to the mountains, even if I was going to have to struggle to find an internet connection, you know, to get some high-speed internet out there, because there are some places that are way out in the boonies. Um, some of them only have, like, one stoplight. And the, the houses would have been affordable. But anyways, we'd gone house shopping. That's how... Uh, prepared we were for me to get the call that I was going to get the job. We went house shopping. Looking up realty listings on our phone and driving around to see what kind of neighborhoods they were. Yes, we went fucking house shopping. That's probably six or seven days out of that year, last year, we spent thinking that we should be looking at these neighborhoods and checking them out. Like, we were just driving around, burning gas out of my truck, you know, looking at different places to live. And when I got that letter, I just felt like I'd let her down, you know. And I, I passed the phone to her as I was still crying. Um, and the, the part of the letter of ineligibility that is most pertinent to this story, I'm going to read for you now. Um, it's dated, it says the name of the, the tech that saw me all, you know, that initially made me ineligible, did the interview, and then made me ineligible again, confirming her original, uh, decision. It says that, uh, standard seven conflict of interest, uh, the applicant disclosed in his application that he attempted to correspond, uh, quotes, 
with a person in prison in California in the later parts of 2015. His name is Nicholas Bravo. After Nick Bravo got out of prison and into a treatment facility, I corresponded with him on social media. This was in regards to the widespread belief amongst the YouTube community that he was a patsy for a larger title theft ring. Ellipses. Only Nick Bravo was caught for forging his way onto real estate deeds, forging the quit title paperwork for dead owners, and selling the property. To date, the other two have not been brought to justice, and Nick Bravo has not said enough to implicate the other two. End quotes. This correspondence would indicate a conflict of interest. Therefore, the applicant is deemed ineligible for employment with the Colorado Department of Corrections, CDOC, at this time. If the applicant is willing to cease any and all contact with this offender, she may reapply two years from the date of his ineligibility letter. And, and I, I made sure to say that exactly as is, uh, because, yes, they, they mispronounced me. I'm not the bearded lady, okay? So, <clears throat> there I was in that, uh, in that Korean restaurant, bawling my eyes out, and Misty started saying, uh, all of the platitudes that you would expect to be said between two people who have majored in psychology. And I remember looking at her and saying, that's the bullshit that I tell my clients. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it would have been a, a nice thing for you guys to be able to see me in that state. But we went to uh, an art store where I could buy some art supplies uh, to make myself feel a little bit better. And uh, in the drive home, she told me about some of the thoughts that she had had about uh, me getting this job. And one of them was that she read a story where there was somebody who had the exact same job that I was applying for, and they had ended up suing the uh, Department of Corrections because uh, at one point a guard was outed as, as doing something bad to one of the inmates. And that guard was fired. And the rest of the guards decided to take it out on the counselor who had been in the corner of the prisoner that had been wronged. And the way that they did it was uh, this counselor was supposed to go through this courtyard in order to get buzzed out on the way to her car after a long day of work. And when she got to the door where she was supposed to get buzzed out from the courtyard, uh, she the guard that should have buzzed her out didn't buzz her out. She turned around and realized that the courtyard was full of prisoners, and all of the guards that should have been there with the prisoners were also absent. So she decided to start up a conversation with one of her clients in that prisoner population to get a circle around them so that she would get some kind of protection, as if she wasn't stuck there, you know. She didn't want to let on that she couldn't get out, and she decided to talk for some time in this circle of prisoners in a, in a, in a kind of uh, uplifting manner in order to basically have some defense against all of the prisoners realizing that she was there alone and the guards wanted her to be alone there with them. After some time, she was finally buzzed out but she then filed a grievance, uh, won a very large settlement, and uh, it kind of shows the kind of uh, camaraderie that the guards have amongst themselves. Um, many of those guards got punished for what they did to her then, and uh, it shows that, the, that there's this thin blue line thing that goes on in prisons. And uh, Misty said to me, and this one actually did land uh, versus all of the platitudes that we normally tell people when they're going through a loss. Uh, she said to me 
that it probably wouldn't have taken long for me to have a conflict of interest because I always advocate for my clients where I would be uh, doing the right thing and I would be turning in the guard for doing something wrong to a prisoner. And this was actually something that came up in, in my integrity interview. I was asked, what would you do if you were told that you were, you know, if you were told by a client that they were being mistreated by the guards in a way that was improper. And I told them that I would probably report what I heard to that person's supervisor with the caveat that much of my conversations with the clients are confidential, and unless they want me to say that, you know, if they tell me that I cannot say that, then I'm not going to report it for them when they can report it to the same person. Um, but I would report it, you know. And that, I felt, went into her decision as to what kind of person I was as far as uh, my ineligibility. I, I definitely feel like, ironically, I was made ineligible in an integrity interview for having integrity. And I still believe that that was the right answer. You know, regardless of what kind of uh, willingness to toe the thin blue line that she was looking for, I still believe that's the right answer. And if we're going to uh, make the prisons a better place where there is less recidivism, in the world. We need to have people with integrity like that getting these jobs. Unfortunately, that job to this day still remains posted, and it has no end date for that posting. People can still apply, but uh, they're not getting enough people taking that job because it's very, very hard to get. They're not finding people who go through ethics classes to become counselors being a good fit for working within the prison system. And I don't have to wonder why. I know why. They're looking for people without ethics. I'll finish the story by telling you that uh, after I got rejected by this job, I found other jobs with similar benefits packages and work that work with similar populations, just not uh, while people are incarcerated, uh, that work with people uh, while they're on the outside to keep them from the cycle of recidivism. And I found comparable pay and comparable paths to advancement in my career. And I'm not as sad as I was then because I wasn't looking for uh, every way that I could apply myself. I had basically for years modeled my life after that one job posting and all the requirements in it. And after uh, getting all of those prerequisites to that job, I found myself uh, very much employable in, in other places. And I am not sad that I used that as my shopping list of things to do, um, I'm only disheartened by the fact that uh, they're not getting the kind of people that they need for that position because they don't want to change, and they don't want people to do the right thing, and they don't want people who are of integrity, they want people who are loyal to a T. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to be reapplying after two years of never talking to, uh, or sorry, uh, being willing to cease any and all contact with uh, Nick Bravo or anyone else that I might uh, encounter while I'm on the job now who uh, is being adjudicated by the criminal justice system and needs counseling. You know, I'm not going to turn someone away just because they might affect uh, my future employability, I'm going to give people 
on the job and off the job, my ear, when they need it. And, like I said, that to me is, is integrity, and I'm not so sad that I lost that job. Take care, you guys. See you next time.